All right, so again, welcome to an introduction to eBird part two. Uh, my name is Ethan Bott, um, and um, oh, there we go. Uh, so this is the outline of the lecture today that I plan on going over. Uh, last time I kind of ran out of time, so um, I'll be starting off with submitting a checklist online uh, on the online www.ebird.org um, site. Uh, we're going to talk about um, some important things about submitting a checklist online. We'll probably spend actually quite a bit of time on this uh, topic. Uh, then we'll go into uh, what constitutes a meaningful checklist and how to really make a valuable checklist uh, for the science. Uh, in my previous lecture, I, I mentioned a lot about how important uh, submitting the data to eBird is for science, and that's really one of the more a powerful reasons why people use eBird. And so you want to make that data as meaningful and impactful uh, for the scientists who use the data. Uh, then we're going to go into rare birds and rare bird alerts. Uh, I know a lot of people are um, uh, looking into rare birds and finding rare birds and stuff like that. So um, how can you set up email alerts that will trigger to you? Um, for a variety of different scenarios and locations and birds. Um, and then I'll go into how you can become a better birder uh, using some of the photos and sounds um, within the eBird uh, library of photos and sounds. Uh, and then if I have time, I'm going to show you how to edit your profile uh, to include photos and description of yourself. Um, I think for some people, eBird kind of becomes like a new social media type thing where you can have your, your Facebook profile and your Twitter, uh, stuff like that. Uh, so I'll show you how to do that and then we'll end with a uh, question and answer. Um, so we'll see how far I get. <laughs> All right, so the first thing for sum submitting a checklist online is you're gonna uh, need to know where you were, uh, how you did it, and what you saw. Um, I'm going to obviously go into depth into each of these three uh, categories. Um, and here is the overlay of the eBird website that you should see if you're following along right now. Uh, if you go to eBird.org, uh, this should pop up what you're seeing. If you don't have an account uh, in the upper right hand corner, uh, it, it, shouldn't, it will ask you to sign in. Uh, but if you made an account from last time, uh, feel free to sign in. And um, if you don't have an account, no worries. Uh, um, it should still work. Um, so we're going to go first into the uh, where part of submitting a checklist. And um, I'm just going to give you a, a bunch of different uh, um, recommendations to think of when you're doing this. And um, so we're going to reference this before, then we're going to go through it, and then we'll come back to remind ourselves of these. So the first thing is being precise in where you place your uh, location, uh, where you birded or where you saw that bird. Uh, you're going to use the find it on the map tool uh, to plot your location. So I'll show you how to create your own location. Um, uh, if you birded at a hot spot, uh, on the right is a map of Lake, uh, or is of Milwaukee. And, um, so we have Lake Park here in the top right. We have Riverside Park in the middle, and then we um, have Lakeshore State Park down here. And each one of those is a hot spot where people go um, specifically for birds, and uh, rather than somewhere right in the middle of the neighborhood might not be where a lot of people are going. I'll go more into depth about that. And then uh, um, you can enter data into statewide and countywide um, level databases. Uh, I'd avoid using that. Again, being more precise is a lot better for the integrity of the data. And then using shorter checklists over longer ones. Um, and then I'll show you how to create your own yard list. Uh, all right, so I'm gonna share, stop sharing, and then share again. Uh, ah, we'll, uh, uh, Here's our backyard research page. Feel free to check it out. Um, we have a lot of cool stuff in there in the research section. Um, okay, so you're gonna go to your eBird.org 
And right now I'm logged into the Urban Ecology Center account. And you immediately see some quick stats about uh, the data that we have, uh, how many checklists we've uh, compiled, how many species we've seen, um, and some other uh, random stuff. But what we're gonna do is we're gonna submit our first checklist online. So we're gonna go to the upper left-hand corner to the Submit button, and you're gonna click on Submit. And you're, it's gonna ask you at the top, uh, it's gonna show you three, three numbers, one, two, and three, and that correlates to the where, how, and the what. And so where did you bird? Um, if you're starting for the first time without, uh, if you just created your account, you probably will not have any locations here. The Urban Ecology Center has a lot of locations of where we birded with field trips and other stuff. <coughs> we have a wide range of uh, locations that you can uh, pick from. But let's pretend that- That's the birding list. Sorry, what was, your, what was your question, Jean? Oh, sorry. Oh. It was a mistake. Oh, okay. <laughs> Um, so you're going to go to find it on a map. Uh, why don't we type in Milwaukee and I'm going to pick a uh, spot in Milwaukee where I'm going to pretend that I um, uh, was birding. Pretend I am in my backyard and I live in the Upper East Side. Uh, we'll say I live by Bel Air and I'm going to be using this uh, zoom in tool on the left to zoom in specifically say to my house, um, say I live um, right here at this house. And so I see a bunch of birds in my backyard living at this house. And I want to create my uh, a location of where I see the backyard birds. So what you're gonna do is uh, I could click right here in my backyard and we'll drop a pin, but some people don't want to give that precise precise information of what like, it kind of indicates of where you live. And so you can kind of just uh, shift it from your backyard and I could, I could maybe say, this is my location of where I saw that bird, just to protect your privacy and your, 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 um, uh, where you live if, you're, uh, if you wanna do that. And then you can do enter your location name. And so this could be, uh, if this is your backyard, this could be Ethan's uh, backyard. Uh, you can name it um, Milwaukee, my Milwaukee yard list, Ethan's Milwaukee yard list, uh, kind of whatever you want. Um, and then you can click continue. So I'm going to go back uh, briefly and talk a little bit about the other options. Um, you can, for, for picking location, um, you can uh, also use latitude, longitude if you have specific coordinates, if you were maybe out uh, in, for some trip in the middle of nowhere and you somehow had a GPS location, you could enter it here. Um, and then that, what I talk, talked about before is that you can select an entire city, county, state, or country. Um, this is if you don't have uh, precise information of where you were, if you don't remember, something like that. Um, so we tried to avoid uh, entering data at this broad of a scale where it's really kind of unknown exactly where it happened. Um, and so I highly recommend having a specific precise location and that will help the data uh, at eBird significantly. Um, so I'm gonna pretend now that I was at, uh, let's see, Riverside Park Urban Ecology Center. Um, and I was birding there and I will pick that as my location and I'm going to click continue. Um, also, oh, I should, I should mention about um, if you, if you uh, were birding at a hot spot, you can also do it by finding it on a map. Um, if you type in Milwaukee, uh, you can select a specific hot spot that you went to. If you, if you were birding uh, not at your backyard and you went to a popular birding location, uh, for example, we have uh, Lake Park here. So you could, you could select one of these as well if you birded there. So if you went to Lake Park this morning or yesterday, you could pick that as your uh, location that you went. But if you were birding over here in your backyard, then you would create your own yard location, name it, whatever you want. 
All right, we're gonna go back and we're gonna pretend that I was at Riverside Park uh, at the Urban Ecology Center. I'm gonna click continue. All right, now we get into the how, um, how we birded. Uh, this information is really important. All the information that you actually enter before you submit your checklist or before you get to the birds you saw is super, super important to the data. Uh, without this, uh, it, it, it brings a level of, of uh, spatial and temporal components to where you were, how long it uh, took, and how you collected that data. So first you're gonna put in the date of where you, of when you observed the birds. Uh, let's see the dates, the 24th today. So let's say uh, I went this morning. Um, you will see that there are five different options to pick from, uh, traveling, stationary, historical, and incidental. And when I click on more information, basically uh, you're gonna pick a traveling checklist if you have traveled, uh, whether that's uh, walking, uh, biking, or, or using a car on a route that's less than five miles. Um, you can see preferably less than five miles. If you're going out and back, if you're walking, uh, say, uh, along the lake and you're birding, um, you're, you're going to, you're going to, you're not going to, count the full, like if you walk out two and a half miles and you come back two and a half miles, you're only gonna say, you wanna say two and a half miles rather than five miles because you're duplicating the distance that you walked in. If you did a loop that was two and a half miles one way and then the other half was two and a half miles, then it'd be a five mile walk. Um, but uh, if you're walking over the same part that you've already traveled, you're gonna um, uh, take out that, the distance that you've, you've duplicated. Um, and then uh, stationary would be um, if you're at your, your home, you're hawk watching, or you're just standing and watching the hawks go over. Um, uh, so that's pretty self-explanatory. Historical is if you have data from the past uh, that you'd like to submit uh, to eBird. Um, and then incidental, um, I use this one quite a bit actually. Uh, um, and I'm gonna talk more in depth of like what an incidental sighting is. Um, uh, but basically what it is, is if you see a unusual bird, usually you would use this if you see an unusual bird and you want to submit it to eBird. Um, and so for example, I saw, a, um, I saw a bald eagle fly by a couple days ago and I submitted that to eBird, um, but I didn't stop and, and uh, bird for uh, for a few more minutes and so I'm going to get later into why this would be an incidental sighting and the difference between a complete checklist and a non-complete checklist um, but just in that case if you just see one bird and you're like oh cool bird um, and I want to put an e-bird you would use in incidental sighting in this case. Uh, the other options are um, banding, uh, would be the most common one for the Ecology Center and all these others I would probably never never use at any point. But we'll say I was at Riverside Park uh, on a traveling uh, bird walk and I will put in the start time. Let's say I was at 8 a.m. and I went for one hour and 20 minutes and say I went 1.3 miles. If you use your phone uh, it will track your distance and your time and your start time. And so that's super nice. Uh, and then party size will say I went by myself. Um, and again, this information is really important to eBird to know uh, at what time you went. Like if you're seeing um, hawks flying around really early in the morning, soaring really high or um, you might expect to see that more during the afternoon or something. And the duration is really important too. Um, if you reported seeing uh, 15 turns flying by, was that over a 12 hour period or was that over an hour period? That really helps like um, determine the importance and the value of that sighting. And then the distance is again important. Were you birding over 50 miles or was it over one mile? So if I saw 15 turns over 50 miles, 
that's really broad and like where were those turns seen? And so when I bring that down, crunch it down to a specific time, uh, duration and distance, um, it really brings value to the data that I'm submitting. All right, so that is the how. Let's see if I have any other notes on that, okay. And then we will click uh, continue. Um, I'm gonna go back to my PowerPoint. And we're now gonna get into the uh, what we saw, to the actual birds that we saw. And so I'm gonna walk you through this kind of a sample checklist that I submitted before from the Urban Ecology Center account. And we're gonna, um, I'm gonna show you some more specific details on how you can uh, submit higher level details of the sightings you saw. Um, and then uh, including breeding behavior, uh, sex, um, age, and stuff like that. All right, we're gonna go back to uh, website. Okay. Um, so it is, it, it is organized right now by um, uh, taxonomic rank. Uh, you can change things over here in the preferences uh, to see how you want it to uh, show up to you. Um, uh, right now I have always show breeding code. I'm gonna get to that. Um, and then you can choose over here if you want, to, as Tim said before, that he's really pushing for um, you to learn scientific names. Um, right now I mainly know common, so right now I have both common and scientific names will be shown. Um, and then you can save preferences here and change anything else. Uh, language over here and stuff like that. Um, so let's say I saw uh, two Canada uh, goose here. Uh, I would. I would type in two on my keyboard, uh, and then I could continue down the list. Um, say I saw one redhead, uh, and continue on, and you'll start seeing that it's going to uh, start categorizing as you uh, as you as you scroll down um, based on families of birds. Um, let's pick a good. Uh, Let's pick a, oops. Uh, say I saw two, no, that's not two chimis, so it's like for the good bird. Okay, two killdeers. Um, actually, no, let's go to cardinals. Uh, I'm gonna use that example I had on my PowerPoint and say we saw two cardinals, a male and a female, and you wanna submit that extra detail to eBird. You're gonna click on add details here to the right and you're gonna see this box pop up of a variety of information. Um, so you could type out, say I saw one male and one female cardinal, um, but the easiest thing would be to go to the age and sex uh, button down here, and you'll see this kind of uh, box of squares pop up. And uh, say I saw a red, fully red uh, cardinal, I could then do one there, and I saw a uh, brownish and a little bit of red uh, cardinal, which would be a female. You could put that information here. Um, that, again, is more detailed information than just saying you saw two cardinals. It gets to a deeper level. Um, say I saw them copulating, and uh, it's right around this time, when, uh, time of year when that's happening. You can then click on the breeding code drop down here and add that additional information. Uh, let me find it. And you would then uh, select the appropriate one. You'll see that this ranges from uh, the most definitive evidence of breeding behavior down to kind of the broadest, not necessarily means breeding behavior. So at the bottom, it starts as flyover, if it's like, oh, you, you, you saw it, to nest with young, which is 100% uh, um, um, that, they, that they bred. Uh, so depending if you saw, a lot of people I've been seeing have been, uh, have been uh, listening, carrying nesting material. And so they've been seeing cardinals with uh, little sticks or straw or something. 
Um, so you can list the appropriate one here. Um, so we'll say, uh, I saw calculation there. Uh, another example I want to show you is for the bald eagle. Uh, the reason I'm picking bald eagles, we'll say we saw three bald eagles and I saw um, immature ones. Uh, this is a, a, a bird that you can tell the age when they're flying over if they don't have their, um, uh, if they don't have uh, their fully brown and, and white feathers uh, that's so defining for an eagle. And so um, here I could say I saw an uh, immature eagle. Um, I can't tell the sex of the bird based off of that. Maybe there is a way, but I'm not sure. And so I'd say I saw one immature eagle, and then I saw two adult uh, bald eagles, and I would go like that. Um, so that's how you use the uh, uh, age and sex uh, box down there at the bottom. Um, and then the breeding code. You don't always have to do this, but it's helpful if there is, if you think there's evidence of breeding behavior. All right. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about, talk about is uh, if you can't identify uh, the species, um, let's think of a good example. Um, hmm. um, let's go with, uh, with gulls. Uh, and so in Milwaukee, we have a lot of herring and, and um, ring-billed gulls right here. And oftentimes you can't identify them when they're, when they're flying super high up. And it's important to, uh, include, um, to include that data still, but you don't know what species they are. So that's where uh, eBird has created the, the SPA, is what they call it, the SPA species. And so this is the general species of what you saw. And so you, maybe I saw 10, 10, 10 gulls flying up there and I was able to identify uh, two of them as herring and one as a ring build. And then the other seven, I have no idea what they are. And then I could do seven Larry species here. Uh, I'm trying to think of another example of what that works for. Uh, I can't think of them. You, Feel free to type in the chat if you can think of another example um, of that. Um, oh, for duck species, you can do that for ducks. Uh, and so you'll see them pre-populated into here. Um, looks like someone's chatting with that. Um, so that just, just for you, as I said in the previous lecture, it's more important to be uh, accurate and precise in, in the birds. And so if you can't tell what type of duck it was, rather than guessing that it's a green-winged teal, um, when you don't really know, just go ahead and put duck species. All right, another thing I want to talk about is using the, the letter, or the, uh, uh, yeah, the letter X. I thought I said the number X, uh, the letter X. Uh, this is, uh, a lot of people in, who have started the eBird use X when they see things. So instead of saying they saw two Canada goose, they would put an X and they would put an X for an American widgeon and an X for a redhead. Uh, the X is reserved mainly for historic data where you don't have precise numbers. And, um, or, and so in our case, if you aren't able to get an estimate of numbers of birds that you saw, then you would use an X. So it is okay to use an X but you're gonna need to know that it's not gonna bring the full value uh, to the data when you use an X. Again, did, if I put an X for, for uh, common turns, I could have seen uh, one turn or I could have seen a uh, hundred turns. So it, it helps out the, the data side and the researchers, but uh, so it's just best to give your best estimate of, of, number, uh, of birds. Um, all right, so let's say I'm gonna get into a bird counting exercise. Uh, um, sometimes we'll see a big flock of, of geese migrating or gulls or something like that, and they're gonna fly by quickly or you see them down uh, on the water and it can be overwhelming to count every single one. And so you might be tempted just to put an X. I saw a ton of uh, Canada geese. Um, um, but I'm gonna go through an exercise to help you 
give the best estimate because again, the best estimate is better than putting an X. Um, all right, so say this is what you're, you're seeing right now. You're, you're out birding and you see a bunch of uh, Canada geese out there and you're like, holy cow, I am, I'm not going to be able to count all of this. So the best thing to do about this is to proportion the large amount of birds into countable sections. And so usually you want to pick tens or fifties uh, uh, as a way of, of counting, of dividing them up. So, uh, so right now I have uh, divided it up into one section where I estimate that there are around uh, 40 to 50 in there. And then I divide the rest of the, the picture or if you're out in the field of your view, into, uh, in this case, six different sections. It depends on the number of birds because you're again going for that 10 uh, to divide the birds up into groups of 10s or, or 50s. And then uh, as they, I briefly counted how many birds I thought were in each of these. And so I found about 42 in there and then um, about 51 in the middle top and then 62 in the top right one. If I just, if, if I just spent time counting in the top left corner, I could have then multiplied by three across the top to get my estimate. Rather than counting every single bird in here, which would have been, uh, in, uh, which would not be feasible really, you can use this method. And so the reason why I, you should also do this for, so you have to think about depth of vision. And so you can see the further back you're looking, the more populated it is uh, um, with birds due to depth of vision. So on the left hand side, I'm going to count the birds in this top left section and in the bottom left. And then I'll multiply this by three across and I'll multiply this one by three across. And I'm saving myself time by not having to count these four sections of birds. So hopefully that makes sense. I see people uh, chatting. Um, I don't know. Well, we, when you asked the question about a, a genus, uh, it's easy to tell genus and species, some, some suggestions came up. Great. So this is the, the best technique um, for counting a large number of birds quickly. It also works if they're flying. Um, if you can uh, count 10 birds and then however what proportion of space that took up, then you multiply it by the rest to, um, to, to fill the, the, say, the flying V formation of geese. Um, another important thing is to, to, to look for other birds in here. As you can see right here in the middle, there's some type of gull um, in the middle. And so, and you see one in the top left. And so you, there are usually other species of birds um, sneaking in with a large group. And so if you can, um, uh, include that. So I saw one of them and I multiplied by three. And so I'd say I saw three gulls, maybe that's a herring gull. And so I then would have three herring gulls, even though it looks like there are only two in this entire top uh, section. Uh, um, but it's just a way of, of estimating large numbers and you also helps you estimate some of those other uh, species that sneak in there. Um, all right, now we're going to go on to um, um, submitting photos and videos and pictures uh, and sounds uh, to uh, your checklist. All right, uh, let's see what example am I going to use. Um, okay. Uh, let's say I saw a great egret. Where is that? So I, I, if you want to jump to a species really quickly, a little trick is if you do control F, this little search function will come up and you can jump uh, to a species really quickly. Let's say I saw one great egret and um, I got a cool photo, which I did, um, and I want to um, submit a photo for that. Um, what you're going to have to do is 
Uh, oh, okay, yeah. First, you have to click on in the bottom right here, are you seeing the complete checklist? I'm going to get to that soon, but just say yes for now. Uh, and you're going to click uh, submit. All right, then it will get you to this, uh, um, to the review page of your checklist. And you're going to click on add media here. Okay, I'm going to click on add media. And um, uh, so the picture I want to add is for the great egret. And I'll go find that. And they'll bring me into um, my computer. There are a couple ways you can do that. You can click on add media, or you can drag the photo that you have. Oops. I just dragged everything. Uh, where is it? There we go. All right, there we go. Great grit, and you can drag and drop it. Super easy to add a photo to your checklist in eBird. Um, I'll show you the picture. Uh, so that's a picture I, I was able to snag of a great egret, and I thought it was cool, and I wanted to add it to my checklist. And so there it is loading. Um, hey, Ethan, down. there's a, a question. Is it possible to submit photos on your phone app or not? Uh, it is not. You have to, that's, the, I'm pretty sure they're working on the update for that, where you can add it from uh, your phone. For Android, it may be possible, I'm not sure, but for iPhone, I know you can't. And so it is a big pain because you have to go to your computer to do to download it and stuff like that. Um, so, but I think they're working on the functionality to, to, to bring it onto your phone. Um, so a lot of people love um, uh, submitting photos and, stuff, and videos. And so you can do that for an audio or for a video as well. Probably photos are the most popular way to submit um, or the most popular submission uh, to a checklist. Um, and then you can click, click done. All right, now I want to get into rare, rare birds. I'm running out of time uh, as per usual. Uh, let me get back to my... Which one is it? Okay. Uh, all right, I want to get into rare birds. If you see a rare bird to submit to your checklist. Um, so a rare bird um, could be the uh, glossy ibis would be an example of a truly rare bird for Wisconsin. Uh, I recently saw that in Milwaukee, they've been reporting trumpeter swans, uh, which would be, uh, that would be uh, a rare bird. I'm not sure if it'd be an a-seasonal report. I don't know too much about trumpeter swans. Uh, but an A-seasonal report might be like a warbler in early April, uh, like a black-throated green. In the Twin Cities, they had a black-throated green a week ago. Uh, that would be a rare A-seasonal report. They are, you could expect to see these species, uh, but just not this time of year. Um, another rare rarity that you would expect would be unusually high counts. Like if you saw 30 uh, spotted sandpipers or you saw uh, 20, um, I'm trying to think about some, uh, some solitary creature that you see a bunch of, um, or you saw like a hundred or hundred turns or something like that. Um, those might not be the best examples, but unusually high counts uh, would be um, a, a rarity. And then vagrants, um, like the harlequin duck that was seen in Milwaukee two months ago. Um, and so these four uh, um, categories are what you would put in what we would consider to be a rare bird. And when that happens, uh, you want to give the best description you can, uh, leave comments to help the reviewers out um, because these are unusual uh, rarities and it will be flayed in eBird. Um, so we're going to go through a couple of things. I'm going to go through an exercise where you're going to um, uh, kind of create your own description of a rare bird. The most important thing you can do is to be as uh, detailed as possible in your report of this rarity, whatever that is, a seasonal vagrant, or it's an actual rare bird. Um, and so these are some things that we're going to go through. It's a lot of text, but I just want it to be uh, showing you in a written way uh, so you can have it. So you're going to talk about where the bird was perched or how it was flying, the habitat where you saw it, the distance to the bird, how far you were away when you saw it, 
Um, was it a continuing bird? Has this been seen before? Or are you the first person? Uh, recognizing the rarity of the sighting, acknowledging that like, this is a rare bird and it's not like, yeah, I see a harlequin duck in my backyard pond every single day. No, that's, uh, that's you're probably seeing some other duck then. Uh, if you can tell the age and sex, that's great. And then give a description of the bird uh, and then how you eliminated similar species. So example I'm gonna give you is the Sage Phoebe right over here. I recently saw this bird uh, in, the, in the Twin Cities uh, last week, and um, I'm going to show you my checklist for that. Stop share. Can't find. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna share my entire screen. I think what I'm gonna have to do. All right, you're gonna see my messy uh, how messy my tabs are at the bottom, but um, just ignore that. <laughs> okay, so I saw a Says Phoebe um, at uh, 140th Street Marsh in Dakota County, Minnesota, at this date and time. And um, uh, let me see if I can open it up. I think that's the, can, there we go. So when, you, when you're, when you're uh, submit a rare bird, uh, this, the Sace Phoebe is typically found in Western uh, United States and the Eastern Phoebe is what we see out here usually. So the Sace Phoebe isn't necessarily a rare bird, bird to the United States, but it is to this area of the United States, or to the, to the Midwest. Um, and so, um, let me see if I can split my screen with, where's my PowerPoint? Okay, so, you, you want to talk about where the bird was perched and how it kind of flew, kind of giving a description of the bird. So here I have this Phoebe-like bird was seen catching insects from a particular branch on the far side of the pond while constantly puffing its tail. So I'm giving a description of this uh, that's acting very Phoebe-like and uh, that's, um, uh, that's perching on a particular branch, which Phoebes often do. Um, I don't talk too much about the habitat, except that it's by a pond where there are a lot of insects. Um, and then uh, distance to bird uh, is on the far side of the pond. Um, and then continuing is really important to say that, uh, that I'm seeing a, a bird that's been seen. So uh, I, I got an alert that this rare bird was seen, and so I was not the first person to see this. But if I don't say continuing here, this is a continuing bird that has been spotted for several days. Uh, in this case, it's pretty obvious, but people might then, the reviewers, data reviewers might be like, oh, you're seeing there are five new Says Phoebes in the area, when in fact, it's only been one bird. And so by saying continuing, uh, that's really important. At some point, if a lot of people have been spotting it, you can just say continuing, continuing bird. That's all you have to say. Um, because they, it's, if there are like already a dozen people have spotted the rare bird. Um, for the age and sex, it's a uh, recognition of the rarity of sighting. Again, as I said, if like um, someone says, oh, I've been seeing this says Phoebe uh, for the past 10 years in my backyard, uh, that's not recognizing, they'll probably throw out your sighting because that's unlikely that's happening. Or if uh, the harlequin duck, I've been seeing it for, the past uh, four months in my pond, um, it might be thrown out. So if uh, you recognize it, uh, let's see, where did I say that? Uh, but I'm confident I, uh, oh yeah, I fully understand this bird is well out of its range. Um, so I understood that the range of this bird was not normal. And so I acknowledge that. Uh, for the age and sex, I could not age and sex the says Phoebe. I'm not sure if it's possible by sight. Um, a description of the bird, again, I talked a little about it throughout. It's constantly pumping its tail. Uh, uh, it has a salmon belly, which helped me eliminate this, the Eastern Phoebe, uh, which has more of a creamier breast. Um, and then 
uh, I eliminated the Eastern Phoebe due to the salmon belly uh, there. Um, and then uh, if you have physical documentation, that helps so, so much. Um, almost more in the description if you get a good photo because it's clear that you saw that, that bird. You can see that the, 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 um, the photos I took were incredibly blurry, but you can see a faint salmon belly. It was really far away. Um, uh, but photos definitely help. Um, so uh, you can see I threw in some other photos because I think it's kind of fun uh, to submit other photos of birds that I saw. Um, but that's what it's like to submit uh, a sighting of a rare bird. Um, I'm going to stop share. Um, I was going to go through an example where you all could like kind of like chat a rare bird um, and we could kind of like come up with this, a description of it together, but I don't think uh, we're going to have time for that. So I'm going to move on. Um, but if you have any questions, let me know about um, the description of a rare bird. Hopefully that says Phoebe example gave you uh, an idea of like how in depth you should be writing it and the more data and information you can give and being as descriptive as possible will help it um, to be accepted. Um, you may be nervous submitting a rare bird sighting or, or submitting data of any bird that you see, whether you're a beginner birder and you're like, I don't know if I, what warbler this is. Uh, just remember that every record submitted to eBird does go through some level of data verification. The goal is to have there is a reviewer at every single county in the United States that's reviewing uh, unusual records, rare birds, vagrants, um, stuff like that. Um, and then there is incredible um, AI software behind, uh, behind the scenes that's pulling out uh, really erroneous data. Like if I said I saw um, uh, 50 Swainson thrushes right now uh, in like a five minute span, uh, that's unlikely, and so I'll probably pull that out automatically. Um, so don't be afraid uh, to, to submit your data and really give it the best uh, uh, go to your ability. All right. Oh, yeah. Okay, good. I'm, I, this is really important. I'm getting to submitting a complete checklist. Uh, I, I talked about the importance of that before. Uh, so when you get towards the bottom, you... You see all the birds you've seen and you're ready to submit or you're wanting to add photos now and you're getting ready to submit. You're going to see at the bottom right, are you submitting a complete checklist of the birds you were able to identify? Yes or no. This is so, so important to, to say yes only if it's true. Um, so um, people often get confused with this question and it, it, it's kind of hard to understand. Um, but when you say yes, you are saying that you, to the best of your ability, you identified by sight or sound all the birds with, around you, um, and you weren't just reporting rare birds. You weren't reporting the highlight birds. A lot of us are all about the highlight birds and the rare birds, but we need to be reporting common and invasive species um, just as much. Um, yeah, so not just the highlights of the day. Um, it, uh, let's see, I have some more notes. Um, by saying yes, you are, um, um, you are more accurately showing the presence and absence of all birds. And um, so uh, if I just said I saw that bald eagle incidental sighting, um, uh, or if I submit it as a complete checklist by saying I saw one bald eagle fly by, that means that there are absolutely no other birds in my area and that it was just that bald eagle. And that's incorrect data, and that's not going to help the, the data uh, reviewers. So uh, this question is super, super important because it helps contribute to baseline data on all bird species. Uh, so then we know when I say I saw a bald eagle, oh, and I saw the robin, and I had two chickadees. Um, that's giving me, then we know that they're not rare birds from other uh, countries in my place where I saw it. Um, so I hope that kind of makes sense. It's just like, to, you want to give a complete chocolate list where you spend at least five minutes birding and you did the best of your ability. You're not going to get every single bird, 
but to the best of your ability, you identified the birds that you could. So it allows them to be mapped more accurately. And um, an example of that here is the Stellar's Jay, uh, which is found in Western United States. And you'll see the, the dark purple is where they are heavily, uh, heavily uh, seen or, or uh, recorded in the bird. And then you'll see in the, this is all kind of grayed out here. That's because uh, here in Milwaukee, in, in Wisconsin, we're not seeing seller jays and we're not reporting it. If everybody said no on this complete checklist, we wouldn't know the range based off of our data of the stellar J, right? But if I say, yes, I saw a bald eagle, two nut hatches, and a chickadee, then we know that the stellar J is not in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. So I'm kind of, I, I don't know if that, I hope that makes sense, but um, submitting a complete checklist is super, super important and like, vaults your, the value of your data, uh, in my opinion, exponentially. All right. So I have a, well, just a quick question on the chat. It says, is it of any value to data collection to submit checklists over and over from the so same location with similar birds? I see mostly robins, sparrows, etc. Yes, absolutely. That is, uh, uh, even if you are just seeing common birds, robins, uh, sparrows, and stuff like that, submit that data. Um, that is giving a picture of what is common and what is not. It might be common for you, but like, how is the greater eBird uh, community and database going to know that unless you submit it? So um, keep submitting your data. Um, uh, you're contributing to science every time you submit a checklist. Okay, uh, with the last few minutes, I want to get into rare bird alerts because I know a lot of people are interested in this. Um, I have to, oops, I have to share my screen. Um, wait, which one am I, hold on. I gotta figure out what screen to share. I have too many things open. Okay. Um, so you're going to go back in eBird, you're going to go to explore in the top left here, and you're going to go to alerts over here. Uh, you're going to scroll down about a couple clicks and you're going to be at alerts. Um, you're going to click on alerts and you're going to see three type of alerts you can do. ABA rarities, rare bird alerts, and needs alert. ABA rarities are um, American Birding Association rarities and there are five codes uh, you see code three and above. Code one is like an American robin. Code two potentially could be like uh, uh, like a face Phoebe in the Midwest. Uh, code three, um, I can't get my notes exactly. They, are, they have very specific, code three is a species that occur in very low numbers, um, but uh, so this includes visitors and rare breeding residents like the Ferruginus uh, pygmy owl, um, which breeds mainly in Mexico and is sometimes seen in the US. So that'd be quite rare. Um, and then the code four, five, and six uh, just moves up that this bird has only been spotted at only 30 times in the United States, or has been spotted less than six times, or is an extinct species that we believe would be level six. So you can um, subscribe here uh, to ABA Rarities and that will inform you of every single uh, uh, rare bird uh, coat level three and above pretty much in the North America. Um, I think it's United States and Canada actually. So um, feel free to subscribe there. You just have to, let's see. Yep, you just have to click and then you're subscribed. I'm unsubscribed because I don't want to. Uh, the rare bird alerts uh, would be um, um, if you, eBird has a way of like determining what is a rare bird, whether it's again based off of actual rare bird, a, a vagrant, um, uh, a seasonal visitor. And so you could type in uh, Milwaukee and uh, subscribe. And now this, now I'm subscribed to all the rare birds that are seen in Milwaukee. And I can get that either on a daily or an hourly basis if you click here on change. 
And so right now I have mine set to set to daily alerts. So every day um, I get alerts from Milwaukee about rare birds. So I got the trumpeter swan uh, was a rare bird. Um, I think the v I think I got an email for a very seeing that we're a nature center and um, a worm eating warbler as well was a rare bird um, that was seen yesterday or maybe even this morning. Um, so this is really nice if you want to see those rare birds. Uh, the needs alert is if you have specific birds like uh, maybe you have never seen a black-throated green warbler before. Um, it's not necessarily a rare bird but you would like to see it. Um, again you can go to Milwaukee uh, to the location that you're interested in. Um, subscribe. Actually what I should say is that the needs alert um, uh, you'll see that when you submit uh, your sightings to eBird attracts all the birds you've seen. And say you've never seen a black-throated green warbler before. When you're subscribed to the needs alert in Milwaukee, if there is a black-throated green warbler spotted in Milwaukee, it will then email you uh, saying um, uh, where it was and stuff like that. Um, so the needs is specifically to you of what you have not seen yet. Um, let me know if you have any questions on this. I'm flying through this because I'm about out of time. But I just want to show you the one last thing is if you go back to the Explore button in the top left um, and you click on Target Species here, this is similar to the Needs Alert. Uh, if you click on it, um, it won't send you an alert, but it'll just show you what birds you have not seen, whether that's based on a time component or a location component. And so I might go to Milwaukee. Um, I'm, I want to see what birds in Milwaukee I have not yet seen. Um, we'll say forever, year round, and my life list. You can have different lists. Up. And then I can show target species. Now the Urban Ecology Center has seen a lot of species. Um, so our, our, the birds that uh, um, we see are pretty, pretty rare birds, um, but mainly, I mean, some of these are seen on the lake, but where the river, where the urban ecology center is located, it would be rare. Um, but this is just an instance of like seeing what birds. Okay, I want to see a great black, great black back gull, and um, then I would go to the. Um, if I want an alert for that, I go to the alerts, and I go to the needs alert, and I'd sign up for them in Milwaukee, in Wisconsin, for the Midwest, for the entire United States, and then I would get an email telling me where and when that was spotted. Um, so, um, yeah, uh, let me see what else. Okay, we're gonna end it with a reminder of how to make a meaningful checklist. Um, Okay, so again, just a reminder how you can make your bird observation more valuable to science if they are collected using a precise location. You know how to set up your own precise location now in eBird. Uh, you understand the type of burden you did. Was it traveling, stationary, uh, incidental? Um, try, to, um, uh, try to have a stationary or traveling. Uh, it's ideally because then you're specifically burning. Incidental is fine. Give the best estimate of the number of birds you see. Uh, um, try to avoid using X in there and try to give it your best guess. And so you can, for large flocks, rather than saying X, try to, try to break it up into clumps to uh, count how many birds you see. Um, bird in underbirded areas, uh, I'm gonna show you a slide next. Um, re re recording temporal components of how, how much time it took, right? It was seen over 12 hours, over 12 minutes, that's a huge um, importance for the data. Um, and then submit complete, complete checklists each time you go birding. Um, these are uh, really important things that will help you, um, that will help the data you collect be more valuable in science.